Welcome to Through the Ringer. I'm your host, Tate Frazier. We got a fun show today. We're going to be talking NBA with Howard Beck, but first and foremost, we got him back in the building. It's Cousin Sal. Yeah, I'm yeah. back before Beck, baby. Let's <laughs> do it. You. It's great to see you. Great to have great you back to here. See you, man. you are now not in a disclosed uh, location. You're in this location, and we got a lot to talk about. Mm-hmm. And uh, before we play my favorite game, we got to do this. We got to talk about First Tate. Yeah. I know you've seen First Take, Sal. Why but... shouldn't this be your favorite game? It's got your no, name in it. Very, very there, few there is people no have game a name. Here. This... A game with their name in well it. this is very serious you know what oh, i mean okay. this is right. this is no joke sal yeah let's go let's do it <laughs> get locked stuff. in i love serious sports talk all right let's go first up <laughs> first tate i say to you former panthers quarterbacks are the real mvps through four weeks of the okay. nfl season of course i'm talking about sam darnold mm. mvp candidate baker mayfield who looks like tom brady at times on the field seven and one uh these are both two guys that played quarterback for the panthers not too long ago Interesting. not very well uh to be honest sal right. but they look good right now so what do you think about and that and they're the real MVPs the first few. You know, let's let's give them both the MVP awards. That's four fine. Weeks. I, I might have to say Will Ferrell's PayPal ad is uh, <laughs> is the MVP, but only okay. because it gets unlimited reps. Right, on it's a everywhere. Sunday. But wow, yeah, you're right. Baker and Sam Darnold. It's a little crazy. Jake DeLome, is he hovering uh, he, over? He like just a got inducted into like the Carolina Panthers Hall of Fame, so he's around. I think it could keep going with these Panthers guys. <laughs> what about Cam Newton? Would Cam he be Newton, worse? He, he's than with Shador Snoop Sanders Huntley? and Travis Hunter. Yeah, yeah right. He's they, having they're like ignoring it. him, but he can make it. You know, if he picks the the right ascot, I think he can find his way back. Yeah, into I the think league. we'll give him a win. Let's say eight and one for the Panthers quarterback. So uh, good news for Bryce Young, by the way. Maybe there is a future uh, after oh, the Panthers. Great news for. Bryce. Yeah. That guy's got it made. He's got it made. Another <laughs> one for you, Sal. First, Tate, I say to you, Terry Bradshaw owes my entire home state of North Carolina an apology for his awful accent. He I was trying this. to lead into the game, talking about Andy Dalton. He went with the Elmer Fudd mm. impression. Uh, obviously, we're from the South, so we get that, but I did I did take a little bit of umbrage to that, Sal. What do you do think Do we have that? the clip here? We should show Yeah, people, let's show right? the yeah, clip. Okay. Let's see this. Well, that's a question everybody's asking right now. Down in Carolina, Andy Dalton's be facing his former team, the Bengals. All right. So All right. Yeah. yeah the, listen, <laughs> I'm offended, and I've never even stepped foot in the state of North Carolina, and I never will. You should will. go. Never, ever will. No, no, I might. But in his defense, Terry, he is an 80-year-old man who was mm-hmm. dropped on his head repeatedly when he was three. <laughs> so I don't know what to say about this, but it was it awful. It had like a Cajun tint to it. I think he was going like uh, New Orleans maybe. He's I, not I, trying. He's, he's never been to North he's Carolina He's like, I'm either. Southern. I'll just put some – I'll just make myself sound right. dumber, and that'll be that. But you're right. He should be banned from every Bojangles uh, in the country. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jake DeLone will make sure that happens. So we'll <laughs> work on that. Last first date here, Sal. I say this to you. Raheem Morris actually said it first, but I'll regurgitate it. A little pun there. Uh, stats are for losers, especially when they're being used to explain why a mm. uh, unless they're being used to explain why the winners won. Um, that's when stats are good, but usually, right, when you talk to a team that just lost, there's a guy on the team that's like, well, at least I got my, you know, yeah. three catches and a touchdown, right? I mean, stats are typically for the losing team, and Raheem Morris was asked after the game about Kyle Pitts not getting targets, right. and he said, stats are for losers, and I tend to agree with them. Well, he's trying to pump up Kyle Pitts as like pumping up a dead ferret at this point. You but ever seen him run around, by the way, Kyle Pitts? I have. So it is so uninspired. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's a very, we, we this man does not get out of his break very quickly. It's rough. But yeah. you know what? As far as stats not meaning anything, if I was like 23 and 40 as a head coach, which mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that's what Raheem Morris is, 36% clip, I would also say stats don't matter. Oh, right. But yeah, stats don't matter. Give me an extension. <laughs> They're for Mr. losers. Yeah. yeah. We'll stick with that. Right. I'm with you, Raheem Morris. Now we get to play my favorite game. Okay. So we're going to do some over under reactions and and we're going to start with your Cowboys, who this is a, an incredible line here. I say to you, Sal, the Dallas Cowboys are going to make the playoffs this season. Yes is minus 110. <laughs> no is minus 110. Nobody knows, not even Vegas. What say you over or under reaction? Uh, I say, well, they are going to make it, I mm-hmm. think, is an underreaction. Not, not by much, but <laughs> I. Well, why do we have to start your favorite game with my least favorite question <laughs> right now? All right, here's how we're going to do it. Okay, I know everyone's like the bad stretch coming up with, mm-hmm. you know, Pittsburgh, Detroit, San Francisco. Yeah, BS was licking his chops asking you about this. Let him yeah. lick whatever he wants. And a lot of things <laughs> Some to lick. Some pizza. Yeah. yeah. All right. They win one of those three games. I don't think that's asking a lot. Mm-hmm. Maybe against Pittsburgh. That's three wins. They split against uh, Washington and Philly. That's five. Beat the Giants again. I think that team's toast. That's six. Panthers, Bucks, Bengals, mm. Falcons. That's ten. Ta-da! We're Guess in the what? Playoffs. You're in the playoffs. Your division is going to be key. We already lost to the Saints. We have to win the 
other three in that division. And I think you made a good point. Getting to five and five, you feel good about that. Then right. you can get to ten wins. So just I just showed you. I mean, how easy yeah. is that? I mean, I laid it out <laughs> just, for you. Just hold on for dear life, Jerry Jones, and right. let's get to ten wins. <laughs> uh, next up, we're going to stay in your division, the NFC East. Jaden Daniels, I say, will be a better NFL quarterback than Caleb Williams. Obviously, number one, number two pick over or underreaction. Um, I think it's an underreaction. And look, I'm not one of these reactionary idiots who just saw a couple weeks. I picked him to win Offensive Rookie of the Year. So I feel like I should get some credit here, as much as even Jaden Daniels has, for playing. Uh, I can go into his stats, but forget stats because they're meaningless. Yeah, they're for losers, right. Yeah, we losers. just learned that. I don't yeah. want to be a loser in Raheem Morris's <laughs> eyes. That's the last thing I want. But his presence, his uh, confidence, the way he moves around in the pocket makes me think he's a little bit of ahead of Caleb Williams, who could also be good. I know he's got the he's got the goods as far as the rocket arm and everything. But I'm going to go with, yeah, Jaden Daniels is going to be better. I'll give you one stat. 82.8% completion percentage, uh, which yeah. is better than Brady and Manning during their prime. You're a loser, so, You're a loser for I, even bringing I know. That up. I'm a loser. Yep. But I will say this was good news for Jaden Daniels fans. He's also a little bit older, so give Caleb Williams right. some time to develop. Uh, let's yeah, talk he's going to have to retire in like four years, <laughs> yeah, Jaden Daniels. Right. So he's got to get it all done quickly. Yeah, do it now. Win <laughs> now. Uh, let's talk about Derrick Henry, Sal. Mm -hmm. Derrick Henry was a bigger offseason addition than Saquon Barkley over – underreaction yeah if you look at offensive player of the year right now i think well maybe they're about the same but i think barkley was ahead of uh odds wise of henry which i thought was strange uh yeah i think henry's the better pickup i think they're both mm -hmm. very good but i think there's going to be more meaningful carries for henry in december and january i still don't know what's up with that philly team it might not even just be their offense defensively they only really showed up against the saints so um i think the Henry pick is going to stand out more. And the dur durability of uh, mm -hmm. Derrick Henry is unbelievable. If you're Saquon, you just want to be like that, you know, that far sure. into your career at this point. I mean, the speed, the breakaway speed of that size is insane. Uh, let's talk about a guy who's continued to be durable. Joe Flacco, Sal, mm. should be allowed to win back-to-back -back Comeback Player of the Year awards over or underreaction. I'm going to say under, not only underreaction, <laughs> I think he should be eligible for Rookie of the Year okay. also. Yeah, it's because a restart. It's a restart every single time. Like, he's starting his career. I think uh, it's ridiculous that a team like the Dolphins didn't pay him. I think he's guaranteed four and a half million dollars. You got to get step up. Give this guy. How about I know the Browns. This, like, uh, why couldn't they just keep him around? Browns, just in there's case. talk that it was. You know, you don't want to hurt. Uh, what's his name? Deshaun Deshaun Watson. <laughs> this is a business, as far as I know. <laughs> don't worry right. about hurting feelings. So, uh, yeah, definitely, I think he should be eligible for a backup. And I'm not. You know what? I've made a case on Simmons for Hall of Fame mm. if he takes his Colts team to the playoffs. Yeah, I want to see it. 2013 Ravens, still one of the most yeah. incredible runs we've seen in the playoffs. Very Eli Manning esque when he right. did that. Uh, let's talk about the Chiefs, uh, Sal. The Chiefs can't be the AFC favorites with their current injuries. Obviously, Rasheed Rice going down, really just decimated across the board. Uh, yeah. Luckily, they have P. Ryan in the backfield and Kareem right. Hunt uh, over Is he under not a reaction. No, okay. He's not yeah. Receiver. All right. Yeah. Uh, I think it's an overreaction. Mm. I think they have to be the favorite. I think Mahomes for MVP is a little – that's a little tight at plus 230. But I think the Chiefs for the AFC still have to be, even with their injuries, because they find a way to win. Mm -hmm. Always a close game. Who are you going to put above them? The Ravens, who didn't beat them. You know, it was by a toe, but that was it. The Bills, who can never really beat them in the playoffs. I kind of think it has to be the Chiefs, as long as it's Mahomes and Reed. And there could be a pickup along the way. Let's talk about Devontae Adams possibly being free if there's, you know, salary cap implications. Go find them, but... They'll be they'll build up. Yeah, we saw uh, Devontae Adams was on uh, Up and Adams today talking right. to Kay Adams, and he said he hadn't even heard from his coach who liked some post that he was going to get traded. So a lot of uh, very you know. weird that they're brother and sister. You know, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't right. even think. Yeah, <laughs> it's a beautiful, yeah, beautiful. They don't family. get along like they even know each other. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's talk about Georgia and Alabama. I say to you, South Georgia and Alabama will run it back in the national championship game, a la twenty twenty two. Is that an over or under reaction? I'll say over reaction for now. Here's the problem with these good teams: you haven't seen them butt heads like mm -hmm. we saw with Georgia and Alabama. Alabama. We haven't seen Ohio State play Oregon yet. We see that next week. We haven't seen – we saw Texas with a pretty good win against Michigan, but who knows. And Tennessee is just rolling. They put up points against Tennessee's everybody. Tennessee's the scariest of all the SEC fun, teams. Right? Yep. So I'm not necessarily going to put those two, Georgia and Alabama, back in the championship game. I will say Kirby Smart should be – should feel about as good as he can after a loss mm -hmm. with that, George. They, put, they showed some guts and determination getting back in there. And Carson Beck – 
you know, right at whatever wrongs he had in the first quarter. He was so. really bad in the first half. Yeah. He has the best odds to be the number one pick still right. after that Saw first that. half. So that's uh, something to keep an eye on. Uh, let's look at the Heisman situation. Travis Hunter, mm-hmm. it was, uh, I say to you, Sal, it was too early for Travis Hunter to strike a Heisman pose in September. Right now he's plus 600. Uh, but Jalen Milrow is still the favorite right now to be the Heisman winner over or underreaction. Well, I think uh, I think that's an underreaction. I think it was a little too early. Yeah, I, I didn't but like it. Maybe it's not his fault. I, I don't think you could help but get caught up in this deal. <laughs> nonsense where you have to you know mm-hmm. be a it's little a show right be a little buffoonish on there but uh he has moved down he was like 90 to 1 35 to 1 18 now 6 to 1 so he is being recognized but i think as far as striking the pose goes i think you should have to check with desmond howard as to when the right time mm-hmm. is because he waited until when was it, it was like late Late November, I think, when he did it, right, is when they uh, probably the best the time to do it because at really that point we, you you know you're going to be one of the Heisman they had candidates. They the Big at Ten at that point. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. That seems right. Yeah. Uh, Dion made sure to remind all the media members they were three and one uh, after the game this weekend, right. so showed some humility. Thanks, that Dion. was nice. <laughs> They're going to make a bowl game, aren't they? Yeah, they Damn definitely it. are. Mm-hmm. And he's probably going to have Travis Hunter up there uh, at the Heisman Trophy yep. ceremony. Maybe both Shador and Travis. We'll see. Uh, last one, Sal. I don't know who put this in here. Uh, <laughs> I say to you. I I will have over under one and a half pumpkin spice lattes during the month of October over under reaction uh, or I guess over under you think you think I'm going to have more than that or under than that uh, I I am going to say over and here's how we <laughs> oh, get no. to it yeah <laughs> I think so well you could you have a lot of control over this I have yeah, to okay. say so it's almost uh, as, whereas not so much if who gets fired by Halloween. You mm-hmm. kind of do have control. I can make some calls. I think the girlfriend one night it's like uh, <laughs> mm. uh, you know. Tady Wady, is that what she calls you? <laughs> yeah, Tady Wady. Like, yeah. Let's go get let's uh, let's go get a pumpkin spice, and then you right. have one just to appease her. Mm. You know, you you take the uh, sissy bullet for a second, right? And then you like it, and you're like, oh my god, you're sneaking <laughs> off every three days and getting. No, one. this isn't going to be a Bravo you're TV have eight situation. Eight or nine yeah. pumpkin spice lattes that's, in October. That's how they get you. No? Uh, I had one sip of a pumpkin spice coffee. It wasn't a latte, oh. but you know, and a Keurig cup and everything, and. and uh, no, <laughs> no, not for me. Not All for right, me, so. okay. Uh, but you know, anybody out there Good. that enjoys it, don't put mayonnaise in it. Whatever you do, <laughs> yeah, we'll pull a Will Levis, even though he might start another game. We'll see what happens. Let's call up the Riverboat captain. We got a fun one this week. Let's do some proper culture. I ask you, Sal, what is the greatest taunt in the history of sport? Obviously, mm. this is paying some homage to our guy Dikembe Mutombo, and he's got the best odds here. Mutombo's finger wave is two to one. Steph Curry's night night or noit noit, uh, depending on what language you want to do it in, five to one angel reese pointing to her ring finger 15 mm. to one john cena's you can't see me celebration 50 to one field is even odds what say you sal wow i was thinking about i mean this is a great one mm-hmm. uh a lot of good field options too. How about Miles Garrett when he takes the uh, the helmet and starts swinging it at play? What a taunt that Mason is! Mason Rudolph, like, a little oh, callback. He's yeah. doing it again. Look at him go. He's so funny, but I'm scared. Um, no, you know what? Let's let's continue the the tribute to Dikembe mm-hmm. because it's spectacular and it's repeatable too. Whereas a lot of these weren't, you know, done, done a couple few times. Dikembe with the finger. I mean, what are you going to do as an offensive player who just got swatted when the seven foot two behemoth is sticking that ET finger in his face, waving oh, it back man. and forth? It's the best. And then if you say anything back to him, he responds in that cookie monster voice. <laughs> I'm going to swat you again. And then you're giggling like a seven year old school. Girl. Oh, he's the best. And yeah. the, the fact that you can just say the Matumbo and we yeah. know what you're talking about, I think that even though it is the favorite, it makes it uh, the obvious answer here at two to one. So uh, obviously, RIP Dikembe Matumbo. One of the best people and one of the best basketball players we've seen. We're going to take a quick break. and we come back, we're going to do some line look-aheads and some Track to the Futures with Cousin Sal. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Through the Ringer. We're here with Cousin Sal, and uh, we're talking Thursday Night Football. we got some line look ahead. Sal, are you fired up? I mean, we're at week five. Can you believe it? I am. I can't believe it. I feel like we're getting to that spot where they've run out of good games on Thursday night. We're going to have to wait till like, Thanksgiving to see. we got bye game. weeks. This is, bye weeks, yeah. 14 London non-bias. game. There's uh, a lot of happening. Wake up week early five. on the yeah. West Coast. You waking up? Be honest. You waking up for I'm going to be on the East Coast. Uh, I'm going to be in oh, North Carolina. Just to weekend. make it easier yes, to see right? the game? <laughs> That's why I'm wow. flying back. That's yeah, exactly. smart. I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah, if you need some place to sit. 
Jose. It could be your first time in North Carolina. You can come check it out. Yeah, well, let's talk about the NFC South. The Carolina Panthers, obviously, in that division. Not looking great. We'll talk about that in a second. But let's talk about Thursday Night Football. We got the Bucs taking on the Falcons. Falcons minus one and a half in this one. Total, 43 and a half. What do you like here, (laughs) Sal? Laugh at the one and a half. (laughs) The one and a half is the new three. Yes. And it's perfect for the Falcons. Like, they should be favored in every home division game Mm -hmm. by one and a half for the next, like, six years. The young way coup, you know what I mean? Whenever he wants to come in, right? Yeah, you can blast one from 70 yards, but they're going to be up 15-13 or down 15-13 in the fourth, and you're like, oh, that one and a half makes a difference. I wish I could figure out an edge on this game, and as I talk to you here on Wednesday, whatever day this is, I I think Tampa Bay is the better team, but I just don't screw with the Falcons right now. I'd rather just watch from from afar. You know, they they get very limited production out of their offense, Mm -hmm. and they're still in it in every game in the fourth quarter. So this is a stay away from me. And the division is always, uh, there, there's always, anything can happen in a divisional yeah. game. We saw that last year with the Raiders and the Chiefs, right? That game made mm-hmm. no sense, but it's divisional stuff. So it's hard to really pinpoint what's going to go on here. I do think the Bucks, whenever they're on a certain level of a high after coming off that Philadelphia game, I think they come back right. to earth here, and I think the Falcons win this game. And now everybody's predictions for them to win the NFC South looks a lot better. It's uh, tough because I don't think an NFC South team has put together two wins in a row in like 16 years. So <laughs> something has to get, you know, right. something has to give this Well, week. the Bucks have won three straight NFC Souths, by the way. Oh, uh, divisions. Yeah, divisions. Yeah, so uh, that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, the Falcons haven't won since 2016, so maybe this is the year. Uh, let's look at the player props in this one. You like uh, Kyle Pitts, actually. I don't like him at all. <laughs> I like, th- thankfully, <laughs> Fandle offers an under, a negative. Oh, aspect come on. Of this. <laughs> 30 and a half yards. I can't believe this is an option. Mm-hmm. I think Fandle's looking to go uh, bankrupt here. Uh, it seems too good to be true. I, I don't think we talk about it enough that Kyle Pitts is the worst tight end of all time. If you look at where he was, he was picked fourth. No mm-hmm. tight end has ever gone higher than fourth. You know, he's so, supposed to be a Hall of Famer. Yeah, right. And he can't get the ball <laughs> of like three targets and nothing. And like you know, under thirty-one yards in five of his last six games. I think he averages twenty-two a game in that stretch. I think he'd have to get 12 receptions to top 30 yards. I'm going under here. I had a Falcons friend of mine who reached out, and he said that Kyle Pitts runs routes like he knows he's not going to get the football. (laughs) He just (laughs) runs it very lethargically. I don't know what that is, but, uh, yeah, I like that under. Uh, I got one for you, too. I think Bucky Irvin, anytime touchdown. Only one touchdown this season, one rushing touchdown. But I think maybe in the receiving touchdown or rushing touchdown, whatever way you want to spin it, Bucky Irvin. Buck the duck. They like him. He got it twice down low. Actually, last week he scored and it was called back. They gave it right to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's Bucky a man Irvin, I like him. I, I like you and Simmons talking about how he could be anything—a yeah. catcher, he could be a boxer, he could be a UFC fighter, or whatever he you want to go. NASCAR driver. I could see it. He yeah. could be—he could serve you pumpkin spice lattes <laughs> at Starbucks. There's a lot of versatility. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Bucky Irvin, for serving those up. Uh, let's track to the future NFC South winner. We talked about it a yeah. little bit here. Falcons are still the favorite at plus one sixty-five. Buccaneers plus one ninety-five. Saints plus two twenty. My Carolina Panthers at plus eighteen hundred, but still a fighting chance. Better than the odds were a couple of weeks. Yeah. Ago, who do you like here? Well, my deal was I because I looked at the schedules, I'm like, wow, the Falcons are so much more talented than everyone. I was probably mm-hmm. wrong about that, but I said they're gonna lose all three or, or one, two of the first three, so let's wait till those odds go up. I was right about that. I still don't want to take anyone in this division, mm-hmm. I want to stay away, watch the carnage from the <laughs> Spotify sidelines, wherever we are here, mm-hmm. and not got, get involved. I don't have any skin in the game. The Bucks are erratic. The Saints are good when Taysom Hill is in. Oh, yeah, really good. Baker's the best quarterback in division, but then they lose to Denver. Like, well, what What? what were the Falcons or the Falcons? I'm going to stay back. What about your Panthers, Tate? This is a winnable division. At 18-1, to 1, get in there, Red Rifle. Make some of these games <laughs> close. Right. 18-1. to 1. Made Cincinnati sweat this weekend. Yeah. They're still like a competent football team with Andy Dalton. Now, right. I don't know how far he can take them, but plus 1,800, why not take a swing at it? And I will say, Taysom Hill, we talked about the tush push last year, fourth and one. Fourth and goal, third yeah. and goal, third, whatever it is. If it's a one yard situation, I don't think there's anybody better than Taysom Hill. I, really I good. put him in the Hall of Fame. And I then mean. he's in the Hill of Fame, but they, <laughs> what, but then he gets hurt, and you might as well mm-hmm. just the team should just get back on the bus. Yeah. What were your Panthers? When was the last time they won this division? 2015, Sal. So okay. That's uh, that was 15 the big year. in one year. Wow. I went to that Giants game in New York. Oh. Uh, Odell Beckham before the game and Cam Newton jaw- jawing off at each other a little bit. Right. Um, an incredible comeback from the Giants. Panthers were able to hold him off and get a win. 
Great game. We had to rush to the airport, my whole family, to get out of there, but we didn't want to leave because anything could happen. And then the Super Bowl, we remember Cam Newton didn't dive for the ball. Mm -hmm. uh, he said it was a business decision, but uh, they haven't won the division since that business decision. So right. it was bad business, I think, as, business. as we look back. And, and then uh, I Peyton love Cam Manning Newton. made a business decision to hug the Papa John's guy after yeah. the game. Uh, that maybe not a great business <laughs> Not decision, a great business decision yeah. there from Peyton Manning, but now he's on the Manning cast and he's yeah. all right. But Cam, you know, That's he's got a true. podcast and things are happening. But maybe there's a way for them to get over this curse i don't know what it is for the panthers but i think okay. we maybe bringing cam back into the fold in some sort of advisory role i don't know that's it they've that's tried we talked about do it remember Bring when he back. yelled i'm back uh, when mm -hmm. he scored that touchdown against the cardinals we've yeah. had some moments where we thought we got over the curse i'm but... back look at something else uh but plus 1800 maybe the panthers could be back Why we'll not? see what happens uh we got some FanDuel weekly specials we want to highlight here um derrick henry right is someone that you like and you like this week special that FanDuel has. What I is do. it? I do. I don't know. Am I reading it right? Derrick Henry to record 35 plus rushing yards in each half. Now there's only two halves, mm -hmm. right? Okay. <laughs> so 35 plus 550. He's averaging 175 yards rushing in the last two games. Asking for 35 in each half in Cincinnati, which is a bottom five rush defense. What am I? 35 in each half is specific, but it's not like 20 in each quarter. Mm -hmm. Help me with the math, Tate. I like this. Plus 550. I like it at plus 550 as well. It does feel like FanDuel may have talked to someone in Cincinnati. Cincinnati, mm. I call them the sandbaggers. Uh, uh, they, they start out the year. They play all sheepish. Oh, we don't know anything. Everything's a mess. Right. And then we look up in week 10 and we look at all of our over and under reactions and we say, we're dumb. Why, why do we let Joe Burrow and this team mm. get away with this again? Uh, but Derrick Henry, he looks unstoppable. If he gets some momentum, he's hard to bring down, obviously. But 35 seems like a low number. And uh, 270 and 271 in the last two weeks rushing the ball for the Ravens yeah. as a team. I mean, right. my goodness, yeah. this is a team that knows how to run the football. So I take it plus 550. Yeah, 35. Wait, 35 yeah, and 35 dude, is 70. 70. It's averaging 175. So 35, <laughs> 40 and 30 is 70 also. Yeah. That's no good. All right, we're going to work this out. Yeah, this is yeah. good math. I think uh, for all the kids at home, uh, keep up. we got to get these props together. But a weekly special from FanDuel and Derrick Henry. Go check that out. Plus 550 is the number. Now let's do some upset specials, and we're going to look yeah. at college football for this. What do you like here, Sal? I like Syracuse over UNLV. This game is Friday. Oh, Our this friend is Harry, Harry. Yeah. is trying to go. He's a big Syracuse fan. Why can't he go? I don't know what it is. He's a working man. You know. I thought he was a die. He told me he was a diehard Syracuse yeah, yeah, yeah. football fan. Yeah. They're coming to the well, West Coast. he's a he die soon fan, I think, more than a diehard fan. But, yeah, they don't come to the West Coast more. Go to the game, Harry. I yeah. like them, though. Plus 190. Uh, it was 162. It went up. I'm mm. back in McCord. You know, Fresno State went against this uh, UNLV team. They he, The Fresno quarterback, not very good, threw for over 300 or close to 300. Syracuse can create turnovers. I'm still not sold on this uh, Haj Malik Williams, who replaced, um, you know, the, the NIL scandal guy, Shuka. But – Good spot for an orange upset, I think. Plus 190 here. Do you think Friday that the night. UNLV team is a little bit galvanized by the fact that their quarterback did quit on them? I mean, yeah, there's got to be a little By the something. way, he's a Holy Cross guy. I don't know if you knew this. Right. Yeah, that came Holy over Cross, from Holy Long Cross. Long Island guy from Holy Cross. <laughs> yeah. That's my alma mater. <laughs> right. I can't find it on a map, but... <laughs> No, I would say, yeah, I think it is a little, it does inspire them a little. But and then they, they had guys talking about paying the O line the money that he was owed, you know, that yeah. Sluka was owed. So, and then, like, yeah, there. but then, like, they find out Harry's not going. It's like, mm. all right, maybe we'll take our foot off the gas. Yeah, right. Because Harry's got to be in the building. Harry, what about you? you yeah. Like an upset? I, I got an upset here. This is going to, we're going to stick in the ACC. I mean, obviously, UNLV's not in the ACC, but who knows at this rate? They could be at some point. Uh, I'm going to take SMU plus 195 mm. over Louisville. It's no shot to Louisville. I think Louisville's a better football team than SMU but sometimes when you don't know who you're playing and it's just kind of like uh, you maybe overlook this game Louisville's ranked number 22 they're playing at home they yeah. expect to win this game I think SMU's got a little bit more fight than maybe at Louisville will give them credit for they get down early and it goes sideways very quickly so SMU's I'll, good they right. played BYU tough they beat uh, Florida State and who else did they beat they have a uh, TCU mm -hmm. uh, at one point those teams were good you know and SMU TCU is a rivalry game right, right there Fort yeah. Worth Dallas so I like SMU plus one ninety five. I like so it. I'll take Let's it. Let's take uh, both of ours. Yeah. One of them's gonna win. Come on, plus one ninety, plus one ninety five. Don't do a teaser. Uh, we don't Definitely do not do, don't do a teaser. <laughs> after the Buffalo Bills no, teaser that no. killed everybody this weekend. Gross. Uh, we're still They're pouring so one out terrible. for that. Yeah, so uh, don't do that. But take them individually, and we'll see what happens. Uh, we'll do another line look ahead here. Who would you rather have make the playoffs? Mm. Now, uh, Notre Dame or Ole Miss? You can get Notre Dame at even odds or Ole Miss at plus one ten. Obviously, Ole Miss just Very lost similar. to Kentucky. Yeah, uh, Notre Dame they. 
they're finding their footing uh, after the uh, shocking upset they had earlier in the year. Who do you like here? This is tough because my answer is neither, really. <laughs> but um, I think Ole Miss will ultimately benefit from playing in a conference unless Notre Dame right. latches onto a conference in the next few weeks. But so Notre Dame, I'm not sure this win over Louisville is going to mean a lot. The A and M win will will win mean a lot if they stay on top of the SEC. I don't though. I just think the SEC is so deep, and I think Jackson Dart. If we're looking at both teams with three losses, that's how one of them would get in. I think you have to look at Ole Miss and Jackson Dart to win big games down the stretch. But my God, Kentucky beating you, not good. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on Lane Kiffin in general? I mean, he just he seems like a little uh, cantankerous would probably Ooh, be the right word. Yeah, yeah I, I kind of <laughs> looked. I wanted to. Yeah, I wanted to lean on him a little bit, but there's that was really his first bad loss with mm-hmm. this team. So yeah, he didn't take it well, does. as no. you'd expect. No, no <laughs> they don't take I mean, any losses. He likes well. covering the spread. I yeah. mean, losing outright right. is really bad. Yeah. yeah, and to do it to a basketball school down there That's in the right. SEC, it does not work. And I know Kentucky fans, you got a good football program, but still, it doesn't look good uh, yeah. when people are from the outside. It's like when Carolina beats Clemson in football, right? Clemson fans are like, wait, right. a second, it's not supposed to happen. Right. Uh, or, Has that happened? Did that <laughs> ever happen? <laughs> no, no, okay. not that I can remember, but close, close. <laughs> Mac Brown went for two. People forget. Uh, let's do another line look ahead. Let's talk about some Major League Baseball. We got Astros Tigers game two right now. Looking yeah. at the odds, Astros minus 168, Tigers plus 142. Tigers win game one. We watched mm-hmm. the end of that together. That was a fun one down to the ninth yeah, inning. I've seen um, you a lot. I watched yesterday that game with you, and then <laughs> right. I come back today for this. Yeah. Um, I like the Astros in game mm-hmm. two, minus a run and a half. So to win by two or more, you're going to get a plus number, plus 128. I mean, Scooble was unhittable yesterday for the Tigers. They eventually took him out. And then uh, the Astros were feisty in the ninth inning, a couple mm-hmm. hits, a couple walks. I think they continue whatever little momentum they had there. Look, they're, they're a veteran postseason team, so I don't think they're going to bow out too straight. They, they're they used to the pressure. So I think they win like 6-3. And it is interesting because you got Hinch, obviously coaching for the Tigers, mm-hmm. who are kind of like the you know America's sweetheart. Everybody loves this Tigers team. Obviously right. manage the the Houston Astros during their most tumultuous and successful period ever. So yeah, yeah. a lot of storylines in this series. So I, I do not see the Astros losing game two. I'm excited to see what a game three looks like there. So that'll be fun. Minus one. Now, the Tigers game. really America's sweetheart? Yeah, I think so, right? Oh, everyone's, okay. everyone's excited about it. You know, Jason Bonet Nettie's getting a lot of right. love. It's not Paul Skeen's girlfriend. It's the Tigers <laughs> well, now. Okay. She's close second. She's in the mix. She's in the running. Uh, let's do another track to the future. MLB postseason special. Sal, what do you like here? You know, Anthony Santander to be the home run leader at twenty-two to one. You know, the the I don't know if the public is able to hear our production meetings because I like this at twenty-six <laughs> yeah. to one. So we're being bugged. But he had forty-four <laughs> home runs, outstanding. Not mentioned because Judge and Otani are one and two in that department. I think they will take this series. I think that you know they had a tough uh, go go about in the first game, but. He's a top three home run guy getting those kinds of odds. I think they advance. So give me Santander at 22 to 1. I think that would be the sharp pick uh, because you are an actual sharp. Mm -hmm. I'm a dull. I I don't know what I'm doing. Adult maybe would be a word for it. But I'm going to take the Yankees to win the World Series and Aaron Judge to hit five or more home runs. Mm -hmm. You can get that at FanDuel plus 440. I hope I don't, that doesn't happen. I want to have a nice. Autumn. I don't think it is going to happen, that, but you know, that's I mean, a pumpkin not? spiced latte for me, right <laughs> yeah. there. That that little yeah, it's giving you headaches. What it is? Oh, uh, I, I don't want to yeah. do that to your Mets fans <laughs> out there, but uh, I just feel like Judge could have a great postseason. I would love to see just for the the viewership purposes a Dodgers Yankees Otani versus Judge on the biggest stage. Why not? Let, yeah. Let's see what happens. Why not? Because that's what everyone wants to see. <laughs> so it won't happens. happen, yeah. right? MLB is not the NBA. Yeah. They are not David Stern. Uh, <laughs> last thing, Sal, the Tate debate. I say to you, and this was a big, uh, much to do this weekend about this comment from Tom Brady, but I say he's right. Tom Brady is right. Pro sports are not played because you want to have fun, Sal. They're played to win the game. We've learned that over and over again. He was talking about Baker Mayfield, Mm -hmm. wanted to have more fun. There was a lot of stress in the building when he went down to Tampa. Uh, Tom Brady Mm -hmm. helped facilitate and create that stress, obviously. But that was to win a championship. It was a quote-unquote championship culture. Tom Brady took a little bit of an offense to it, but he also paid Baker Mayfield some credit back by calling him the player of the week. So it's all good on that in that sense. But uh, I will say I agree with Tom Brady. Not not many times I do. I'm just kidding. Okay. I, you know, I, yeah. I like Tom Brady. But uh, uh, I like this. You know, play play to win the game. I don't care about having fun. Just win. Play to win the game. I'm with you. I mean, this was something that was the little leagues for fun. You know, was, have fun until yeah. like seventh grade. I agree. This then it was serious. a rant he had that was delivered like in six parts. <laughs> Um, the other day on Sunday, and uh, not prearranged or anything. It's totally off the top of his head. 
<laughs> Play to win to get great stuff, Tom. Here's three hundred nine million dollars. Yeah, what, right. What is it though? Like Belichick has got him beat for the uh, mm-hmm. for the commentary thing. Who I know thought? they don't do exactly the same mm-hmm. job, but you would have had seven hundred fifty to one odds that Belichick was the more delightful. Um, I think I think it's in Brady's head too. I think that's yeah. the reason why it's an issue. That's why he Brady's trying him. to come up with these like you know right. cookie cutter segments for himself because right, he's like right, I see right. Bill Belichick with Matt Patricia you yeah. know having a great time and Michael Lombardi on a podcast. Yeah. What's going on here? Well, cookie cutting is fun. And he took his job on the uh, the the Let's Go podcast. That's you know true. I mean? So You're there's right. a lot of connective tissue there between Brady and Belichick. They just can't get away from each other. They no. just they just they love should each sit other down for a pumpkin spice and <laughs> sort it all out. <laughs> That's what they have to do. Uh, so where can we find all your work? And we'll let you go enjoy the we rest of the week. we got Against All Odds a couple times a week on the Ringer Podcast Network. Cousin Sal's winning weekend. Yeah. We have Phil Sims on. Look at that. Uh, and, uh, oh, the Ringer pregame show Sundays. Right it's great. There. I enjoy the Ringer pregame show. It's how I get prepared for the day. And uh, nice. I love when Bill comes in and he kicks off one of the, you know, the wise guys. And, and yeah, you guys have a fun we're not going to let him do that anymore. <laughs> I like that he compared you guys to like a wedding day that you didn't want to see each other, uh, you know, before you did guest lines at night. That, was fun, <laughs> that so. is true. Yeah, that was When good. did he say that? That was when I kicked you off oh, a couple I weeks see. ago. Yeah. He was like, uh, you know, this is like you don't want to see the bride before the wedding gotcha. day. Gotcha. All right. That was, was a good, good analogy. That makes sense. Yeah, good job, Bill. Uh, <laughs> Sal, you're the best. Thanks so much Thanks. for coming on the show. I got to get a wedding dress. Yeah, you got to go <laughs> you figure that out. We'll be right back with the Ringer's very own Howard Beck. Stay right there. Welcome back to Through the Ringer. Joining us now, he is the Ringer's very own NBA expert. He is back on the show, Howard Beck. Howard, great to see you, man. Great to see you, Tate. How's it going? It is going well. We got a lot to talk about. We got media day happening right now, but we also have a huge trade that we are all trying to figure out who won the trade, who lost the trade. Did anybody win the trade? Did anybody lose the trade? Of course, I'm talking about Carl Anthony Towns going to the New York Knicks and then Julius Randle, Dante DiVincenzo going out to Minnesota. I'll just start there, Howard Beck. How are you reacting to this? And uh, are there any winners in this trade? Yeah, us. We won. (laughs) Yes, the good. media, the media, the fans, the public. It was kind of a quiet summer on the NBA trade front. We were kind of overdue for a blockbuster, so we all we're all winners here. Mm-hmm. Um, no, listen, I think in in the, uh, the the simplest sort of reductive view of this is that the Knicks won, right? They got the best player in the deal. I don't think anybody would dispute that Carl Anthony Towns is the best player changing teams in this trade. So by the usual measure in the NBA. The Knicks win. The Knicks, I, I want to talk about where they sit right now. They do get their center in Carl Anthony Towns. If you just look at the matchup of the Knicks going up against the Celtics, right? I mean, Carl Anthony Towns versus Porzingis, that's a fun matchup. Two stretch fives, two bigs who, uh, you know, obviously have their very unique skill set. You also have OG Ananobi matching up with Jalen Brown or Jason Tatum. Uh, Mikel Bridges is there now with the Knicks. So you can kind of see the blueprint for why they made these sort of moves. Like, where does Towns fit in and where can, and how can the Knicks kind of take that next step with him? In the fold. Yeah, and it's interesting too, Tate, to consider where the Knicks are because if they don't lose Isaiah Hartenstein to free agency over the summer and they were in a position where, based on cap rules, they just could not pay him as much as the Thunder did. But if they don't lose Isaiah Hartenstein to free agency and to the Thunder, if they don't lose Mitchell Robinson to ankle surgery that's keeping him out until probably January or potentially later, I don't know if they're still making the move or not. Maybe they would, mm. but this is where they are. And where they are is, as you just outlined, they're in a great position to go toe-to-toe with the Celtics. I'm not saying they're better than the Celtics. I'm not saying I'm, I'm certain that they can beat them in a best-of-seven series. But they're really well assembled now to try to do that uh, all the way down to, yes, both teams have stretch fives now. They can both play five out. They both have elite defenders. And the Knicks have gotten, over the last year, acquired the kind of defenders in Ananobi and Mikhail Bridges um, throw Josh Hart in the mix, who they already had. And you've got a bunch of guys you can throw at Brown and Tatum. So I think the Knicks, they're, you know, like the whole theme here is that they are all in. From the moment that they made the trade for Ananobi and then rewarded him with a massive contract, max extension, uh, mass, ma- uh, max new contract, I should say, over the summer. And sending out all those picks to get Mikhail Bridges and now going for Towns. The Knicks see a window here where Jalen Brunson is firmly in his prime, has just scratched the surface of his stardom. They've got a bunch of really good role players around him. They needed another reliable star 
And in this case, Carl Anthony Towns, who fills multiple needs, especially because of their gap at center. Yeah, and we might not call them the Villanova Knicks anymore, but they could be the Wildcats, right? I mean, there, there's some other nickname there. I mean, you know, Carl Anthony Towns, he's a Kentucky Wildcat. They're all Villanova Wildcats. So maybe we find some sort of middle ground there with the nickname. Uh, I'm excited to see what the Knicks look like. Uh, let's talk about NBA media days. We got a lot of new faces, old faces and new places, I should say. Uh, a lot of people that uh, have seen these pictures for the first time, a little bit jarring. I wanted to get uh, some of these photos that maybe stood out to you, Howard Beck. Obviously, we got the CP3 Wimby pick. It kind of beckons back to Manute Bowl and Muggsy Bogues. Uh, just the discrepancy between these two basketball figures. You got Clay Thompson now with Kyrie down in Dallas. You got the Grizzlies with their new starting five with Zach Eady in the mix. I thought that was interesting. LeBron and Bronny. Uh, for you, what was kind of the most jarring thing to see on media day? Uh, Clay Thompson with the Mavericks is is the one where that's just going to take a while to get used to. Yeah, I think for everybody, even Clay wearing a different number, wearing number 31, right? And, and obviously he said he was doing that kind of as an homage to Reggie Miller, one of the best shooters that we've ever seen in the game. But if you told someone in 2016 that in the future Kyrie and Clay would be playing on the same team in Dallas, I think their head would have spun all the way around. So it would have been like a Beetlejuice moment there. So uh, yeah, that, that's very fascinating stuff. We also get a lot of quotes and comments uh, that are coming out of Media, media Day. Uh, the first one I want to start with was Joel Embiid. He said that he's lost about 25 to 30 pounds in the offseason. We did see him, obviously, in the Olympics. Uh, just your thoughts on kind of like either a guy puts on 15 pounds of muscle or he loses 15 pounds. How much do you buy into that uh, sort of comment? I mean, I didn't – we haven't seen him on the court yet, and sometimes it's really striking. Like you could see like when the first photos of Zion Williamson a it's few always weeks Zion, ago. Right, right you, could, you could just go see it like, oh, my gosh, he's really slimmed down. But we've seen – Zion slimmed down and then gain again before. In Embiid's case, all I saw was the press conference. I, I'm not saying he's he's not telling the truth. I'm just saying, like, sometimes you can't tell you see, till you see a guy on the court in the preseason. Uh, Howard, we're going to take a quick break. Stay there, though. We're going to be right back with you. we got to talk about uh, your clarity index because there's a lot of teams that are trying to figure out what their season's going to look like in the NBA. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Through the Ringer. We're still here with Howard Beck, and we are still sifting through what to expect this season in the NBA. And luckily for us, we have the genius here, Howard Beck, who is trying to break down the clarity index of the NBA. Uh, we have a lot of tiers to get through, Howard. But just generally speaking, uh, how did you come up with this, and, and how did you come up and, and kind of decipher these tiers on, on your own? So, uh, Tata, somebody who has no rooting interest in mm. any particular team, um, I still have moments over the course of a season where I get frustrated seeing certain teams the way that they are operating, right? And I think of like the Chicago Bulls of the last four or five years are kind of the epitome of this. Uh, no coincidence that they were very low, uh, in fact, in the lowest tier of my clarity index. The idea is, listen, if I as an observer and if your fans can't tell what it is you're trying to accomplish. We're in trouble. If you're in trouble. And so this isn't about winning, losing. This isn't a power ranking. This isn't about uh, anything except, is it clear to us, the public, <laughs> that you have some semblance of a plan? That plan could lo be to lose 60 games and be in the lottery. That's fine. At least it's a plan. Uh, it's not always the case with losing teams and winning teams both, where sometimes you're looking at them and saying, like, I'm not quite sure what you're trying to accomplish here. So I wanted to create a spectrum, uh, you know, these tiers that I that I came up with to kind of, you know, classify teams based on just how clear their agenda is. Yeah, it's kind of like a diamond, right? A through I, they all kind of look the same until you get the microscope and you try to look at what you're looking at there. And uh, we'll start with the Everclear tier. Uh, these are teams that we know exactly. They're an A through I diamond. We know that this is high quality stuff just by looking at it uh, with the naked eye. I want to start with the Knicks. Do we think the Knicks are still here as far as the Everclear <laughs> tier? How do you feel about that? No, they're even more so. Okay, uh, they great. were already in the in the highest tier, and uh, acquiring Carl Anthony Towns being even more all in than they were, um, absolutely clear. You could quibble with if you want with whether or not you think that Towns is the right kind of co-star for Jalen Brunson, or whether he's going to be enough of a rim. Or whatever you want to quibble about, you can. But there's no question about what the Knicks are trying to accomplish. They are all in for right now, and that's the epitome of the Everclear tier. Where I also threw in teams like the Wizards and Nets, who are 
expecting to win uh, very few <laughs> games right. this season. But we know exactly what it is that they're trying to accomplish. Uh, let's look at the next tier, the side view mirror tier. We got the Celtics, Bucks, Timberwolves, and Suns. I want to talk about the Bucks because Dame Lillard said they're going to see the real me this year. Why do they fit into this tier, and what do we expect from Milwaukee this year? Yeah, so this tier, these four teams could have been in the ever clear tier, except that one, that tier was just getting too uh, <laughs> full and I needed more tiers. But also these are teams that it's pretty clear that they're all in. Celtics and Bucks are all in. The Timberwolves, the Timberwolves, I might have knocked down a, a tier okay. after the Towns trade, but but this was before the trade. And the Suns. So these are teams that clearly are contenders of various shapes and sizes who have made moves over the last year or two that are also kind of all in kind of moves, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why they're here. Um, you know, the Bucs, it's interesting, right? Like there's no more all in move than going and getting an early 30s all-star like Damian Lillard, who at any given time might start to really backslide, right? Like there's already some signs of slowing down um, as he's on the verge of, of, I think about to turn 34. So uh, the, the Bucs all in, but with some caveats about whether they can sustain where they are because they've got some age and injury issues. Yeah, Chris Middleton, obviously one of those issues. If they can get him back healthy, that changes the whole uh, trajectory of this team. Uh, let's go to the next tier. We got the Frosted Glass tier. We got Nuggets, Pacers, Grizzlies, Magic Kings. I want to talk about the Magic. They are a very interesting team, and they obviously have Paolo Bancaro, who I almost feel like is underrated at this point. We don't talk about him enough. What do you like about the Magic, and what do we expect in this tier? Uh, the Magic are saying we just need to let our youth keep evolving. And yes, they signed Contavious Caldwell Pope, but I think it, they still have this real glaring need at point guard and they haven't addressed that. And they're not quite all in on adding veterans to their young core. They're kind of slow walking it. So that's why they fall here. Yeah, I like that. Uh, also, I saw KCP wants to be called Kenny Caldwell Pope this year. So uh, a nice update, a change of scenery and, and a change of name. So that's something to keep an eye on. Next one, we got the Kaleidoscope tier, uh, Cavs, Rockets, Pelicans, Spurs, Cavaliers are interesting to me. Evan Mobley showed some signs last year in the playoffs where he might be able to take that leap. Uh, Donovan Mitchell obviously is a top 15 player in the league, a guy who can get you to that next level, scoring-wise at least. Uh, what do you like about the Cavs, and, and what should we know about this tier? Yeah, so this tier, the kaleidoscope tier, right? You look at the kaleidoscope, it's it's colorful, and you can turn <laughs> the thing, and the little pieces all fall. That's kind of where this is, right? Like, the pieces aren't quite settled here. The Spurs are still trying to figure out how to best build around Wemby, and, and they haven't quite made all the moves that they're going to eventually need to make to, to become a contender. These are teams that are still sorting it out. In the Cavaliers case, they've got four guys who are all all-stars or all-star caliber, but they're kind of redundant with each other, right? So Donovan Mitchell, Darius Garland, nobody in the league thinks that that's a long-term viable plan. Evan Mobley and Jared Allen sometimes look a lot better each on their own in the lineup than with each other. And I've everybody kind of expected the Cavs would start to sort this out and move at least one of those four, and they haven't yet. They're running it back with the same group, hoping just for better results under a new coach in Kenny Atkinson. And they're still looking for a small forward, right? I mean, you mentioned those four guys. It feels like they're trying to find that one position there at the small forward. They get Isaac Okoro. Uh, that was the last Woj bomb, obviously. But still, I, I like that. The kaleidoscope tier. You can find anything you like with these teams. I mean, you know, the Pelicans, a perfect example. Zion, wow, that's exciting, you know. And you run through the game at DeJounte Murray, but it doesn't, doesn't quite fit. Uh, the next tier, we got the stained glass tier. And these are the four teams that I think everybody likes to talk about as far as the common fan. We got the Warriors, Clippers, Lakers, and Miami Heat. How do we define this? year and uh, let's talk a little about uh, about the Lakers because they have some positive momentum going into the season with AD and LeBron both looking good in the Olympics yeah I mean stained glass so you know it, it's colorful it's fascinating it's 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 pleasing to look at but after a while it might start to give you a headache the Lakers are giving their fans headaches <laughs> yes honestly um, LeBron and AD still great uh, how about that um, everybody else on that roster eh, yeah not, not so, so great much. and the Lakers yeah, they didn't make a single move over the summer to change their personnel. I mean, this is this is the epitome of the you know definition of insanity is you know expecting a different result uh, with the same exact uh, plan. Like they're not they again another team that did nothing except change coaches. Fired Darvin Ham, brought in JJ Redick, a rookie head coach. I think JJ is going to be fine, but. I don't see how he's going to to turn this team into a contender. Uh, last tier, we got the Funhouse Mirror tier, and there's a lot of teams, including my Charlotte Hornets, that are in here. We got the Hawks, Hornets, Bulls, Pistons, Blazers, Raptors, and Jazz. How do you define this tier? And then I want to talk a little bit about the Pistons. They get Tobias Harris. Maybe there's some hope finally in Detroit for Kate Cunningham. 
crowded bottom tier here, the funhouse mm -hmm. mirror, right? So yeah, this is kind of wacky and distorted and weird. And uh, you just, you're looking at it and you don't even know what the hell to make <laughs> of it, right? Um, the pistons are there because, so I should explain, right? The top tier, the Everclear tier had two tanking teams, mm -hmm. the Nets and Wizards. But the other tanking teams this season, the teams we expect to lose a lot, like Portland and Detroit, who you mentioned, they're here because in Detroit's case, they've already done their tanking. They had their their process, and yet they're still processing. Like you can't be in that tier or in that uh, you know running back that play that many times in a row and get the benefit of the doubt. Uh, they just changed their front office. They just changed their head coach again. They don't have a clear franchise star. They hope it's Kate Cunningham. They're not sure. Um, they're spending their cap room kind of wildly on Tobias Harris, who I don't know. Like I, I guess good veteran presence, but Tobias likes to have the ball a lot. Is mm -hmm. that good for a young team that's still trying to grow? So it just again, no clear blueprint for how they're going to take the next step and become respectable. And you know, uh, every team in this group has uh i think some confusion going on yeah and every one of these teams kind of has like a disgruntled star whether it's you know trey young and the hawks Lamelo and the hornets the bulls with zach levine i mean i know all these guys come into media day and they say they're not disgruntled and they love being there but there is a lot more questions than answers with this funhouse mirror tier and i think that's the whole point of a funhouse uh one last thing howard uh, i want to ask you about the kimbe mutombo obviously the nba lost a legend it was uh, shocking news and you could see the reverberation throughout the whole nba community um, I'm not sure if you have any personal stories, obviously, with the Kimbe Mutombo, but just your reaction when you saw the news. And obviously, a, a lot of people have put out their thoughts and their stories about one of the greatest people we've seen in basketball. Yeah, just uh, very, very sad. Um, to to uh, he was too young. Um, mm -hmm. Can't you know brain cancer? Just an awful, awful, awful news on what's otherwise a festive day. This happened amid you know media day. You know the the celebration of the NBA season returning and and to lose to Kimbe just a literal and figurative giant of the game, uh, a great humanitarian, as everyone knows, universally respected and beloved around the league, and was, you know, just in his prime, was just such a fun figure, right? We know the finger wag, and it was so awesome when he came back for the the, the Geico commercials, you know, <laughs> 10 years ago. Um, it, that's the kind of joy and personality and fun that he brought to the game. By the way, he's just one of the all-time great shot blockers, too. Like, just as a basketball matter, I was looking this up. In 1995-96, he averaged four and a half blocks. Now, that's only the sixth highest per-game average in NBA history, but no one has gotten anywhere close since. That was a, that's a long time. We're talking almost 30 years ago. Um, just an absolute force. And, you know, four-time defensive player of the year, eight-time all-star, six-time all-defensive player. Um, also, I should note, only two-time winner – of the J. Walter Kennedy Citizenship Award. That's a, a community service award given by the Pro Basketball Writers Association, of which I am currently the president. So uh, only two-time winner of that award, which just, again, speaks to all the great service that uh, Dikembe Mutombo did throughout his career and, and in retirement um, for the world. So uh, just a phenomenal, phenomenal figure, uh, a really important figure. And if you want to hear a little more discussion of him and a little bit of personal stories, uh, Raja Bell and I did discuss Dikembe on the Real Ones pod. That should be up right around now. And Raja was his teammate for uh, you know season and a half or so in Philly. So he had he had a lot more up close look than I did. I, I love that. Go check out that show, of course. Howard, we appreciate you coming on the show, and uh, we hope we can talk to you soon. Can you believe basketball is almost here? I can't believe it. Sneaks up on you. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming to the show, Howard, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Tate. There you have it for another week of Through the Ringer. We appreciate you tuning in. Thanks to Cousin Sal. Thanks to Howard Beck. And we will see you next week.